Hello and welcome back to Probability Theory. And first I want to thank all the nice supporters on Steady and PayPal. And in today's part 3 we will talk about two important cases that can occur for stochastic problems. For this please recall we have already introduced a lot of notions and we started with a general sample space omega. Then we can look at chosen subsets in this omega which form a sigma algebra. And exactly these subsets we call events. Then in the next step we want to measure the probability of such an event. And this leads us to a general probability measure we call P. Now I can tell you it's possible to deal with these objects in this abstract sense and then we get a general theory. However, in a lot of applications we find that two special cases are very important here. So now we distinguish between the discrete case and the continuous case. To be more precise I would also speak of the absolutely continuous case. Now all the other possibilities we can't put into these two boxes we will ignore at least for this video. Indeed often at the start of probability theory one focuses at discrete problems. They are easy to explain when we only have finitely many outcomes. However I would also say that we have a discrete problem when we have infinitely many outcomes if they still are countable like the natural numbers. For example, we could throw a die infinitely many times. And we count how many throws we needed to get the first six. Then we are still in the discrete case because we can count all the possible outcomes. On the other hand, in the absolutely continuous case we have infinitely many outcomes but they are uncountable. The typical example here would be a dartboard where you throw a dart. There all the values in the disk are possible outcomes. Ok, so that's the rough idea for the two special cases here and now I would say let's go into the details. For this let's do a table such that we can compare the discrete case and the absolutely continuous case. First let's start with the sample space omega which is a finite or countable set in the discrete case. For example if you flip a coin omega would be a set with two elements. Or giving an infinite example omega could be the natural numbers. On the other hand for our continuous case the sample space omega should be an uncountable set. And usually we can choose it as a subset of Rn. To be even more precise omega should be a so called Borel set. So it's an element of the Borel sigma algebra of Rn. If you don't know what the Borel sigma algebra is don't worry I have a whole video about it. However at least for the sake of this video it's not the most important thing to know here. Just think of a common example, omega could be the unit interval. I choose it as closed here but it could also be open. Ok, that is what you should know about possible sample spaces. Then in the next step let's talk about the sigma algebras. In the discrete case it's very simple, you can just take the whole power set of omega. Of course depending on the problem you could choose a smaller one but there is no restriction for choosing the largest one, the power set. Therefore in the discrete case we don't have to care about the sigma algebra at all. However we really need the notion of a sigma algebra on the right hand side in the continuous case. There in general it's not possible to choose the power set but it's always possible to take the Borel sigma algebra. This means that we don't have all the subsets of omega but still a lot of them. Therefore our probability measure can still give probabilities to a lot of events. Speaking of probability measures, this is the next thing we want to compare in both cases. In the discrete case measuring a singleton, so a set with only one element is very useful. Because if you know these numbers for all lowercase omega in the sample space omega, you know the whole probability measure. This immediately comes out of the sigma additivity of the probability measure. As a reminder it's this property here we discussed in the last video. Now because of this property in the discrete case instead of the probability measure we can equivalently write down a probability mass function. Usually one uses a lowercase p for this and omega is found in the index. Of course in the end it should have the same meaning as this probability but now this function is our starting point. I say function but usually we write it as a sequence. Depending on omega the sample space it's a finite sequence or a countable one. 
Now, because we want to use this for probabilities, we claim that this number is always non-negative. And also the series or the sum through all omegas should be exactly one. If we have such a sequence that fulfills these two properties, we call it a probability mass function. And with this, we can then define the probability measure. For any event A, we can set P of A, the sum or series over P omega, where omega goes through all the elements in A. There you see the big advantage in the discrete case, we just have countably many numbers involved and also only sums. So each probability can be written as such a sum. On the other hand, that's not possible in the absolutely continuous case. However, for a probability measure there, we have something similar. Because, like in the example with the dartboard, the probability of a single point is just zero. There are just too many points to get a non-zero probability for a single one. However, we can say something about the density of the probabilities. Or to put it in other words, it's no problem at all to measure the probability of a whole region instead of a single point. Now, this density function we simply call f, and it's defined on the whole sample space omega. And because we want to measure probabilities, we have the same two properties as on the left-hand side. The first one is, at each point we have a non-negative number. And you see, because in this case omega is a subset of Rn, we usually use the letter x. But still here, x is an element of omega. Okay, now for the second property, we have to translate this sum into a continuous case. This means that here we want that the integral of the function f is equal to 1. It's the integral where we integrate over the whole domain omega. Please note here, in our simple example it would be a one-dimensional integral, but in general we have an n-dimensional integral. But then you see, it's completely similar to the thing we wanted in the discrete case. Therefore, in the same way the probability measure can be defined, p of a is the integral where we have the domain a. Okay, and with this you see, this is our translation between both cases. However, to be honest, I omitted one technical detail here on the right hand side, because here we have to deal with sigma algebras. For this reason, this density function f here needs to be measurable. It's a property we need, such that all the integrals here make sense. If you don't know this term measurable yet, don't worry, we will talk about it later. At the moment I would say it's sufficient that you know that we need some technical detail here. Okay, I think that's enough for the theory, let's talk about some practical examples. In the discrete case let's look again at the example of throwing one die. However, maybe this time let's take an unfair die. This means that we have different probabilities in the probability mass function. So we can bring different non-negative probabilities in, but they have to sum up to 1. For example, we could set all the numbers 1 to 5 to 1 tenth, and then the probability of getting a 6 would be 1 half. So maybe as a test, let's calculate the probability of the event that we don't get a 6. Now by definition, this would be the sum of omega going from 1 to 5, and there we have our p omega which in our case is exactly 1 over 10 for all omegas involved here. And there you see, we get out 1 half as expected. Okay, then on the other side, let's look at a continuous example. Okay, maybe let's take the interval from 0 to 2 here. So you see, our dartboard from before is one dimensional now. So we randomly throw one point into this interval. Then the question would be, what is now our probability density function f? Now, because we want to have a uniform probability here, we need to take a constant function. And because we want to fulfill these two properties, there's only one reasonable choice. We take the constant function with value 1 half. So maybe let's check that the integral property is indeed fulfilled, so we have the integral 0 to 2, and f of x inside. Now we can pull the constant one half outside, and then only the length of the interval here remains. Which is of course 2, such that we get out 1. Okay, then maybe the last question here is, can you calculate the probability of a subset A here? As we know, the probability is defined as the integral, where we integrate over the set A here. Doing the same as before, we can pull out the constant, and only the simple integral remains. 
Now this one is what we call in general the volume of A. Or in this case, because it's one dimensional, we could call it the length of A. Or we would simply say it's the Lebesgue measure of A. This sounds now more complicated than it really is, because for intervals we can immediately calculate it. For example, if we have the interval AB, we can calculate that this is one half B minus A. So you could say in this example we just calculate lengths, but then we have to normalize it. Which means we divide by the full length, which is 2. And indeed, then we get a probability. Okay, with this I hope you now know how to distinguish between discrete and continuous cases. They are indeed the typical examples that occur, therefore it's good to know them. Then in the next videos we will look at more complicated examples. Therefore, I hope I see you there and have a nice day. Bye.